What's going on, you good humans? Welcome to a very fun guest episode of Good Humans Podcast. This is guest episode number 85 with Bonnie Hancock. Bonnie is an absolute legend, and you're going to love this story. If it's your first time tuning in, whether you're on YouTube for the first time ever right now, or you are on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please make sure you hit that five-star rating, and please go and hit that like and subscribe button as much as it sucks having to say that every time. It really does help this podcast move up, and I thank you all for tuning in. A massive thank you as well to our sponsors, Drink A Repper. A Repper is a brain function drink. They truly do make our brain perform at a higher level. Developed by neuroscientist, Bonnie loves it. She is a dietitian, so you're going to hear her talk all about how important it is to her. But also, if you do want to get a discount off this product, you can head to the link in the show notes. Use the code GOODHUMAN. You get a massive 25% off. Take care of your brain. Grab some A Repper. They support this podcast massively and myself, and I'm sure you're going to love the product. All right, on to this episode, Bonnie has a crazy story. Bonnie was an iron woman in the um, surf, ski, swim, paddle races in Nutrigrain and a few of those series here in Australia. But the thing that blew me away that's going to absolutely blow your mind is what world record she just set. She paddled a surf ski around Australia. So think Ned Brockman's record running across Australia. She paddled the whole way around Australia, 254 days. Absolutely unbelievable. She was doing between 8 and 14 hours of paddling every single day, which just doesn't make any sense to me. Kilometers out to sea, couldn't see land for a lot of the trip. And yeah, she broke that world record. And the best thing about it, she did it raising money for Gotcha for Life, a mental health organization who is doing some amazing things in the industry. So she raised over $100,000, which is just incredible. She's also a dietitian, and now she is working as a um, coach for the Nippers at Mermaid Surf Club. I absolutely love this chat. I'm sure you're going to love it too. If you do get something out of it, please make sure you do a little story on your Instagram. Tell a friend about it. If it's going to inspire someone else in your group, make sure you tell them about it. It's always good to be able to bounce ideas and share things that we get benefits out of to our friends. So please do that. Let's jump straight into it. Welcome to Good Humans Podcast. Bonnie Hancock, how you going, Bonnie? Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very well. Uh, another start to the week. So I actually did my first race on the weekend in a while. So a little bit sore today. <laughs> oh, no way. Where'd you race? So we raced, uh, well, actually, we were supposed to race at Manly on Saturday and there was a shark sighting and the shark had attacked a dolphin and then a bit later they found a body of someone who'd gone missing so the whole carnival was cancelled um, but the next day we had a different race at Freshwater so Saturday was drama filled and yeah it was quite a, a roller coaster of a day really. Wow that's, that's <laughs> super interesting I, I heard about that on the news actually I heard someone mm. talking about that there was like a bunch of sharks, like, was it attacking a dolphin or something, yeah? Yes. Like Shelly. Yeah, literally, it's Shelly Beach, so just around from Manly, and we had all of our tents, all of our craft line up at Manly, Um, you know, hundreds, really thousands of competitors. I just got out of the warm-up, and I heard the siren go off, and then I saw the chopper overhead, and they said, everyone get out of the water. It was like something off a movie. Everyone raced out, and over at Shelly, you could see the whole beach lining up, and um, it filtered through quickly that there was a big shark out there that had attacked the dolphin. I think it's bitten its dorsal fin. So the dolphin was struggling and then there were other sharks that came and this chopper floated over and a second one came. So well, we knew it wasn't good and they had to close the beach for 24 hours for safety. Wow. Yeah. That was a crazy weekend it's that you've been through. Weekend. But hey, here we are right. in a new week. Exactly. And today is all about getting to know your story. The question I do open all of my podcasts with is, what are you grateful for right now? Oh, I'm grateful for community and at the moment um, we're right in the peak of our surf life saving season. I've just come back after my paddle which we'll get into and I'm coaching the nippers at Mermaid Beach Surf Club and I race in the seniors so the surf club I live just nearby and just the whole mermaid community it's so beautiful I feel like everyone has a place and is valued whether you want to be a top athlete or just go there to go for a swim or participate. Um, yeah, the, the mermaid community at the moment. Oh, I love the mermaid community. I'm also part of it. I live like literally, you're probably the closest guest I've ever had on. I think yeah. you're about a kilometer, yeah. not even a kilometer away from me. Yeah. I live at Mermaid Beach too. And yeah, the community is amazing. I'm sure you go to Rafiki. Yeah. You've probably seen the little good human gratitude cards at Rafiki before. Absolutely. That is, yeah, I love uh, the green smoothies at Rafiki. And um, yeah, it's, it's again, we talk about community, you know, you see the same faces there. You get to know people you haven't spoken to prior and, um, you know, hear about everyone's stories. So, uh, yeah, absolutely love the area. Yeah. I'm grateful for the Gold Coast too. It's been so mm -hmm. nice. A big change for me mm -hmm. from Sydney, but also a real positive change. I think the community, like you said, is so uplifting. It's like everyone's mm -hmm. up early. Everyone's walking along Hedges Ave, going and getting their coffee, getting outside. And that's yeah. the sort of life that I want to live. But 
Another thing that I do to open every podcast is share with my awesome guest, my awesome sponsor, Drink yes. a Rapper. So a Rapper is a brain drink. And you're a special person to actually maybe comment on this because not only are you an Iron Woman, a world record holder, but you're also a dietitian. So health and what we put in our body is very important to you as it should be for everyone. And as I told you off air real briefly, you said you hadn't tried a rapper before, so this is going to be your first time, but neuroscience, brain performance drink developed by neuroscientists, um, New Zealand neuroberry black currant, Mm L-theanine, and a pine bark extract, no Mm. caffeine, all natural, and yeah, it's going to fire up our brains for the chat, so... Incredible. We'll Thank crack you. these open. We will. A little, little See, cheers. My hands and, um, work after paddling on the weekend. Oh, yeah, I know. You must <laughs> so be a bit buggered. Sore. Anyway, cheers. cheers. Pretty strong, mm. but very. I love black currant, actually. Well, you're going to love Repo, and I'm going to get you sent some because I'm sure you'll be able to give us some good feedback. See, that's awesome because I do, as a dietitian, um, you do see patients, um, you know, unfortunately down that journey of Alzheimer's, dementia, and the effects it has not only on them, but their family. And I think it's so exciting, this sort of thing, this, um, you know, area of research and so much research has gone into this product, as you were saying, um, but something that's really practical and tastes good. Mm. And I think you need to look at the practicality for patients and, um, you know, what are they going to actually enjoy drinking as well that's going to benefit them? So um, that's a really, really exciting space there. Yeah, I'm very excited for what's to come. They're going to be bringing Good Humans podcast to everyone's ears this whole year. So I'm very excited about that partnership, but I'm also excited about getting to know your story now. So how I open all of my podcasts, like I told you off air before, is getting to know your upbringing a little bit so it sets the scene to understand why you've achieved what you have achieved, which is incredible but we'll catch up to there so where'd you grow up what was family dynamics like as a kid and yeah how was life as a youngster yeah well I, I saw um this morning you've had a Barney Miller on your podcast and um he would live down the end of the street from me so I grew up in Sawtell in New South Wales actually born in Brisbane and um I've got three sisters so mum and dad traveled around a lot for work and our sisters were all born in different places so my elder sister Georgia uh, was born in Sydney uh, Courtney is two years older was born in Perth and India the youngest was born in Coffs but born in Brisbane two years there and then um, yeah my whole childhood was spent running around barefoot on the streets of Sawtell and um, at, at Sawtell Surf Club so from a very young age around five uh, mum and dad you know put us into nippers to keep us safe so we grew up living on the beach and with the track straight to the beach you know um with the drownings around Australia it's very important for kids to learn to swim and um I just wanted to do what my older sisters were doing so I think um I'm not sure where are you do you have siblings yeah I've got siblings I've got one older sister two younger grew up in North Narrabeen on the beach and same thing from about five or six got put into nippers for just surf safety yes exactly and I was gonna say when you have an older sibling it's almost like you're always you're watching what they're doing you want to kind of follow um you you look up to them essentially and I still really do um so yes my my two older sisters were out there on their boards I remember taking down my little like boogie board and wanting to puddle out in the back and mum and dad having to kind of hold me back um but yeah and so grew up there primary school high school at John Paul College in Coffs Harbour um had a really I think blessed childhood um from probably around the age of 12 um I knew I wanted to be a professional Iron Woman and it was Courtney and I who really um, stuck with it. So Georgia and Indy were really talented athletes. Um, Georgia was a great runner, national level runner, and Indy was a very good board paddler. But um, I think Courtney and I were really the ones who had our minds set on the professional Ironwoman side. And we used to run, uh, watch Carla Gilbert, who was our idol, run around on the telly. So at 17, um, that's when I made the trip north to the Gold Coast and... Um, you know, you grow up in a place like Coffs Harbour, you do your best um, to train. I had my sisters, but you get to a certain age where you know, uh, moving to, you know, metropolitan area, certainly somewhere like the Gold Coast or like Sydney, they're really the hubs of surf life saving. And um, just having that squad around you, you go from training with two in your squad to 50. So, yeah, yeah. but um, yeah, really lucky with a childhood and... um. My sisters and I, uh, as much as we probably hate to admit it, we've always been, I guess, competitive in that way of when we trained, we were racing each other. And I think that did everything to help me. Yeah, those sibling rival- rivalries can be so powerful watching 
both you and your sister obviously come up through the ranks and the Iron Woman can be a good motivator but also a good training buddy, someone that can keep you accountable to really push yourself. Yeah. I want to rewind real quickly. What was school like for you? With high school, you said you knew from the age of 12 that you wanted to be a professional Iron Woman. Mm. Quite similar to me, I knew from probably 12, 13 I wanted to be a professional surfer, which I think a lot of people go through high school a bit confused. Mm. What am I going to do after school? But mm. for you and myself that path is kind of set. So what was your sort of views throughout school? Did you enjoy the academic side? Were you always just getting out of school to go train for Iron Woman? What was school like for you? Bit of both. Um, (laughs) I love academics. And for me, when I think of school, juggling act. And it always has been. So um, I loved, um, you know, English PE, very much history. Ironic, I'm a dietitian now. I didn't enjoy science as much at school, but um, I love reading. And so for me, it would be cramming in my assignments and study wherever I could. So if there was a free lesson, my friends would be there catching up, socializing. I'm like, I need to use this to catch up on, on work. Um, so yeah, I um, you know probably took after mum in that area. Um, the subjects I enjoyed and really, really enjoyed school and really pushed myself. Um, so I've always had that bit of a balance, but I think I also knew I wanted to go to university and, um, and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to study journalism or something within sport. And, uh, it was at a couple of, I think I was around 14 when I went to my first, um, athletic camps where we listened to dietitians and physios sort of speak to us and, how if you took care of yourself, it would improve your performance. So initially I thought, I want to work with athletes. I want to be a sports dietitian. And that's what I ended up applying for dietetics. But in the end, I'm um, jumping forward a little more work in the GP space with average Joes and Janes and people with um, chronic conditions as well. So really grateful for how that's turned out. But um, I do love uh, academics and I still do love study. Yeah, that's so cool. I think it's um, special to know that you can now help people along their journeys after having such a stellar career. Something that's interesting about your sport, and we spoke about this briefly off air, is as much as it is a professional sport, I'm woman, the funding doesn't sound like it's quite there to make it your full-time thing. Most athletes in that space are working jobs at the same time. How hard was it to commit to something that you could make a bit of money from, but also knew you had to juggle because there is quite a lot of professional sports now where you can focus 100% of your time on it. Yeah. And with Iron Woman, that I can imagine comes with 30, 40 hours a week of training. How did you find that balance once you finished school to be able to make some money, but also be able to chase the dream of being Iron Woman champion? Yeah. It's an awesome question. And, and still to this day, almost on behalf of the next generation, I feel frustrated sometimes. I think the tennis players are absolutely incredible. I'm watching the Australian Open at the moment and you see the checks of like millions of dollars and things. And it's hard to know that as an Iron Woman or an Iron Man, you train two, three times a day, like you said, 30, 40 hours. You have to, to be on that top level. Um, you've got a board leg, a ski leg, a swim leg and a run leg. Then you're looking at doing your gym. You've got to fit in all of your, you know, stretching and massage and that kind of thing too. So you really are working full time hours as an athlete, but you also need to earn a living. So some of the clubs um, support athletes in some way and there's, um, you know, businesses like Shore and Partners who get behind the Iron Man, Iron Woman series, they get behind the Summer Surf series, um, and they are doing so much to take the prize money to the next level. And with that, the standard just continues to rise, which is incredible. But um, the reality is, I when I was at uni, I was on my feet uh, waitressing at the surf club, trying to get some money on the side. Um, you know, if you did manage to crack a race win, you're more looking at about $3,000 as your prize money. Um, it's just not enough to carry you through. So, um, you know, you, you do it the hard way and you do it for the love of it. You have to love it. Um, but the silver lining to that is it does force you to find another passion that you've got so for me it was dietetics and that balance of going to the clinic and working with someone with end stage cancer and then going to training it really puts a good perspective on it and I always say you want something to come back to on a Monday so a a loss in a race or whatever in the grand scheme of things isn't too much when you're you're dealing with that sort of um, population yeah finding that balance and the perspective must be so eye-opening to see people with eating disorders people with things that we take for granted to be so easy really struggling with it so having that balance of oh maybe a little bit like oh poor me why aren't we making more money in sport to being like "Mm, people have got some bigger problems than the problems that i'm dealing with on my day-to-day 
So let's talk about your Iron Woman career. You finish school, you're studying at uni, you're focusing a lot on the Iron Woman. How were those first couple of years out of school in your early 20s chasing and what were some of your biggest results? Yeah, yeah really tough those couple of years I remember yet yeah, moving up 17 and um, I remember doing the first trial and it, it was supposed to be um, down here on the Gold Coast and the surf was like that eight to ten foot cyclone swell stuff um, way too big so they moved it to Redcliffe um, which is the flat you know up near Brisbane um, and it was a blessing for me because we have we paddled big 18 kilo uh, surf skis um, you know they're like six meters or whatever they are a little bit longer they're huge so for a 17 year old I could barely carry the thing but in the flat water I could do enough to get through and I ended up qualifying I think I finished seventh and 10 got through there were already six six qualified from the year before and Courtney and I qualified together and that moment was just incredible up there and um it felt like everything I'd ever wanted, um, you know, happened. Um, but I really had to work for it. It was an intense boot camp style couple of months leading in three sessions a day. You didn't miss one. Our coach Pat O'Keefe had us running up the sand dunes, you know, in the gym doing everything you can imagine. Um, you didn't pull out early. You did the whole thing. So I think the resilience we had to build growing up in coughs with, you know, we trained in 15 degree water in the pool in winter because they couldn't afford to heat the pool. We only had each other. So that really helped me. But I realized that whole other level of training. Um, and then we went in and did the series and I ended up doing um, seven um, seasons of, of the professional series. Um, but yeah, it was it was incredible. I was uh, lucky enough to get some podiums in that time, um, had a couple of uh, wins in a few different races. But it's funny, we were sort of saying earlier how factors earlier in your life can affect something. It's almost like I felt like I never quite got that big win. And I was so stoked. Courtney got some amazing Nutrien Series titles and it was incredible. And when I was out there, I was going for her. If it couldn't be me, it was her. But it was like I was always chasing that big title. And there was a season when I was, um, I think, 24, 23, 24, and I thought, this is my year, this is it. And I had some really promising results. I got third in the cool and got a goal, like a second in one of the rounds. And I remember I pushed myself to the point and overtrained and underfueled. My body was giving me all of the signs. I had headaches, you know, something was wrong. But I was so set on that win that I drove myself into the ground, got glandular fever and had to pull out for the season. And basically wrecked my body where I had to have two whole seasons off out of the sport and, and give wow. it up. And it was as I was coming into the peak, really had the balance of experience and youth. And um, yeah, it just shows I probably didn't have that perspective at that time. I wasn't working. I was still finishing my degree at that time. So I wasn't working in the clinics as much. Um, but yeah, it was a really good learning curve. And I think everything that happened led to what I did um, just recently but it was it was such a hard lesson to learn all of my friends and social network were within the iron woman really seen and I realized I wasn't investing into myself in other areas over training social so when all of that was taken away I lost all of my identity and I had nothing so it took really two years to find that again. Yeah, wow. Well, uh, there's a few things I want to touch on from that. The first is this power of intrinsic motivation. Obviously, growing up in a smaller town, not having access to the resources that the bigger clubs on the Gold Coast in Sydney have, it would have obviously created such intrinsic motivation for you to know you have to do it yourself, mm -hmm. which I'm sure is probably one of the main reasons why that inner voice, when you probably battled it for days on end out when you're doing your paddle which we will talk about around Australia world record that intrinsic motivation like you said that self-belief and those values that we get from a young age can have such an impact on our later life but the other thing I want to touch on you said your sister obviously had some big results took out the Iron Woman Championship I don't know how to question this in the right way but was there moments where you felt 
like you're in your sister's shadow a little bit and you weren't quite reaching where you wanted to. Obviously, you're so stoked that she's winning. Yeah. But were there times where you're like, oh, I just want my year where I have my breakthrough? I think there can be... The mixed emotions will be around that you're training alongside and you might you're have doing sessions. Doing the same stuff. Exactly, where you might have a session and um, you might, you know, do that effort faster or get out the back quicker and like, you know, or in the pool, you swing the t- same times and anything. Why can't I just put that race together? But I think something that Courtney's always been so good at in races is, you know, not overthinking it, um, you know, which allows you to have a clear mind and make decisions, you know, on the fly and all that kind of thing, which in big surf is, as you know, with your surfing, you've got to make those decisions. What wave are you taking? You know, Um, it's, it's huge. And it's the same for us. Um, are you going to risk it and run down to the rip and risk running a bit mm. further and sacrificing that time? Are you going to take off on that huge bomb on your ski and hope that you hold it? And I think she's always been incredible at keeping a calm mind under pressure. And maybe um, when I was younger, I think not having that experience, I did some really silly things. Like there was one race I remember I was winning and I took off on the stupidest way that no one should ever take on a ski ski goes flying and you know you end up swimming in that kind of thing so it was in- incredible to see her achieve i mean like the the wins she got and hard four wins too like she's winning you know some of these things like a cooling down a gold after three and a half hours in a sprint up the beach so the first part of it is i don't think i possibly would have got to be professional lineman without her i definitely don't i don't think i would have trained as hard growing up and I don't think I would have had the work ethic that I do because I was we were always kind of competing but then the second part is you probably question in terms of what am I doing wrong you know just to get that and we're talking like we'd have races where like she'd win I'd come second or like third or that kind of thing and and occasionally it, it did switch around as well absolutely but she was so good at grabbing those big titles because she just did all of the things right in the races too. I feel like I made some really big mistakes in certain races. But um, if there, again, if there's anyone who could have won, it was her. And I remember this one particular race and she was going for the title. And we do the eliminator. So it's three races. You start with um, 18 girls and you knock it down six each time. So it comes down to six at the end. So it's super brutal. You get like a couple of minutes in between each. And I was heading around and I might have been going out in fifth or so and she's coming back on the other side, like racing a girl and it's literally for the title. And I remember like calling out, like, oh, like screaming, like genuinely at that stage. Like I'm like, I'll take the fifth, you know. So there was plenty of that too. So yeah, I couldn't have got to where I was without her. And, um, you know, when I told her I was doing the paddle, the first thing she was like concerned about my safety and worried, but supported me all the way because she knew I was going to do it she just didn't like the idea of crocodiles <laughs> oh that's crazy the, uh, the support you obviously have for your sister it's really cool that you can look at it with a gratitude mindset and be like I'm so grateful that she maybe brought me up to a higher level rather than looking go I wish I was at that level she elevated me I think it's a really refreshing perspective to have and then let's talk about this paddle <laughs> so how did it come about when did the idea come in your mind and yeah, we, we can draw this story out because I want to hear about the logistics, which I'm sure were a nightmare. But yeah, tell yeah. the listener because I'm sure people are probably yeah. going, what's this paddle? Yeah. Do you want to tell us what it was, why you did it? And yeah. And I think it's a good segue that last little bit because I truly think that maybe if I was racing and I feel like I cracked that really big race win, I'm like... I don't actually think I would have done the you paddle. You felt fulfilled. I think achieved. so, right? Yeah. Like, you know, so it's such a catch to Nothing to prove. I truly think that. And I think, so I picked up a book mid-2019. So it was just as COVID was kicking off around the world. And it was kind of like we'd heard in Italy and China. And 2020, sort of, 2019. 20, 2019 is, uh, I'm trying to think what month it was in the end. It, it was been like right mid, at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mid to late, it was... Um, I remember some of the restrictions were starting to be to be brought in and that kind of thing, or they were concerned. And that must have been mid to late twenty twenty then. Twenty twenty was the first year of COVID. Yeah, well, yeah. twenty twenty. Sorry that I picked yeah. it up first. That's yeah. right. So twenty nineteen was when we started here. Um, I think it was overseas. Was it end of twenty nineteen when they first started and COVID? Twenty twenty in Australia. Early twenty twenty. I remember. I went. I went on a trip with. Corona, yes. to, yeah. to, to, oh my gosh. with Corona to yes. um, Hamilton Island in like Feb, and then my sister got married 
at the end of Feb, yep. and then we flew home from Bali, and then everything got locked everything down mid March 2020. Down. There you go. That's right. So, beg your pardon. It was yeah, 2019 that it was overseas. 2020, and I read this book, and it was about Freya Hofmeister, who was the German woman who paddled around Australia um, in tw- 2009. And from the moment I picked that book up, and really from the first chapter, I was in. I never ever had that feeling. In my life, other than that want to be a professional iron woman, like I've got to do this, and this at the age of, um, you know, well, into my 30s, um, to be like, I absolutely have to do this without a shred of doubt in my mind. I was like, for whatever reason, this is, was like I was meant to do it, meant to pick the book up. And it was the third book I picked up, picked up three. One was Winx and the other one was Shane Warne's book. And then the third one was, was Freya's book. And, um... Even the stories about sharks bumping her and crocodiles stalking her for a hundred kilometers. It was like, I got to do that. And for six months, then I went back and forth and try to convince myself why I shouldn't do it. You know, typical like imposter syndrome stuff. Like I'm not good enough. I'm, you know, what if I don't do it? What if I spend all of this time and get everyone to back me and then I don't make it as a failure. And all of those negatives came in. And I remember first looking at my husband Matt and saying I want to do this I want to paddle around Australia I'm reading this book and he kind of looked at me with a blank stare like I think he wasn't sure what to say right so it's like he didn't say anything and I'm like oh Jesus like he doesn't go silent very often Uh, I said I'll revisit with you in, in two weeks two weeks later I was like I really want to do this I just need to get my head around how it's going to work and I kind of kept revisiting it for six months and really after six months he's like you're gonna do this right like and he knew he'd come on board to make it safer I think he thought I was gonna do it anyway I couldn't do it on my own and thank goodness he got behind because he ended up managing the logistics wow but then started the hustle and really um you know I took off in 2021 in in December so it was sort of that hustle for a bit over a year um and we realized like, you know, we just bought our unit. We had minimal savings. Um, we had to sell both our cars. Um, we were both in jobs that we loved. Um, we ended up giving those up and leaning on everyone we could, you know, making as many connections as we could to get the money to even take off. We really only had money to get halfway around by the time we took off. So Wow, so much sacrifice. And do you want to explain maybe for people listening – what you did and then we'll talk about some stories throughout so you're paddling a surf ski <clears throat> which is like you said earlier a six meter kayak i guess you're not a kayak a surf ski yes but for people who don't know what a surf ski is it's like right. a long skinny kayak and you paddled that thing yeah. around the country what twelve and a half thousand kilometers yeah yeah absolutely so freya did fourteen thousand k so um it had only been done four times before I did it. Freya was the first um, female and she'd actually done the quickest. So she did in 10 months, 22 days. Um, it's a hard one. It's it's like, um, I guess, surfboards, like the different types and everyone's got the type that they enjoy yeah. you know, riding more than others. Um, with ours, surf life saving skis are 18 kilos built for going in and out of the surf. And ocean ski is nine kilos, super lightweight carbon fiber, similar length, so six meters. And it's built for downwinds with the run. So, like, you'll see a lot of the big races of the foils might have an ocean ski section mm. as well. Um, the Molokai particularly, which is 50K race in Hawaii, which is incredible. So I was paddling a six-metre, nine-kilo piece of carbon fibre, basically floating carbon fibre. I was the first one to do it um, clockwise. So mm. I did a lot of research into currents. I spoke to meteorologists. I spoke to super yacht captains. And in the time frame I wanted to do it, which was initially six months, which was just ludicrous. I thought I could do it in that and not have to have any weather holdups. Um, the East Australian current moving north to south down the coast. So it pushes the warm water from the Great Barrier Reef down to Tasmania. The biggest part or the hardest part was, and it was always going to be the Great Australian Bite, whether I hugged the coast or whether I cut straight across. Everyone prior had hugged the coast. You could save a thousand k by cutting across, but it took you five hundred k out to sea. Five hundred k out to sea with a thirty-eight foot catamaran next to you is absolutely terrifying. Um, to get across there, you've got to do a lot of night paddling. So 
I said to people, um, when you stand on the beach and look at a horizon, it's 40K that you can see. So 500K out is, it's different out there. The, the water changes. It's um, even in the daytime, the water's dark. The water's dark. And um, we got told that there were killer whales in, in that region. And just to be really careful. I mean, how careful can you be when you're paddling? You just try and keep the speed up as much as you can. Um, sailors for them it's like an initiation of sorts and they try to get across in a couple of days we spent two weeks at sea getting across um, with me paddling and I had to paddle 100k a day because any less or any slower we already went across three weather windows to get there you risk these big arctic blows coming up from Antarctica so yeah it, it's um I'm still processing how we did it and recently I'm actually writing my book at the moment and I put it off for a couple of weeks diving into that, into the bite. And even when it happened, I couldn't speak about it for a couple of weeks after. But um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's terrifying out there. And once we did that, we felt there's nothing more, you know, the country can throw at us. And it was just after that, you're moving into crocodile territory from Broome right across to, to Townsville. So it's a whole other form of challenge and you're risking heat stroke in 40 degrees um, you're up in the Kimberley, which is in the Northern Territory, night paddling where you can literally hear splashes and they were seeing crocodiles in the water around me. So, um, yeah, it's, there's a bit to unpack. Yeah. I'm going to rewind and then we're going to get back through it. So I want to rewind to the preparation involved for something like this. The first thing that comes to mind for me is probably something that wouldn't come to mind for most people, but the logistics of it. I know after watching Ned Brockman's thing, ultra endurance challenge, just seeing like the nutrition that's involved in it is crazy because you're doing a hundred kilometers a day, the calories that you're burning, mm -hmm. the training involved prior, yeah. let's um, hit a few things. So let's talk about the logistics first. You yeah. said you didn't even have the funding to get the whole way around, mm -hmm. but you just went for it. What, um, yeah, what, what, what involved, what was involved with the logistics of getting the right boat? Cause you obviously have to have someone trail next to you the whole way. Yeah, let's talk about how you started to pull it together. It's all, I'm almost glad I didn't know what was coming. I didn't realize the enormous cost and finding, you know, a boat and a crew um, and finding videographers. I knew I wanted to film it. I knew I wanted to share it, but also um, excitingly have the footage for a documentary as well. So it was finding the right people. I mean, you were going to be with for eight months as well. Um, you know, a crew on a boat who would come like and do things like that, like across the bight, like not everyone would do that. Um, Matt really was the, the driver with all that stuff. So he found our crew, um, Ben, Blake and Jamie were the core crew. And um, Jamie um, is um, works in cinematography and worked on Elvis and has a lot of experience in that way. He came on the boat almost the whole time and Blake um, was the other one. And he'd had a bit of experience prior with the camera too. So they came on, they were going to do the filming. Um, ben was pretty much on land crew the whole time and he was our jet ski driver. So he, um, you know, was with Matt on land. That's the other part that people probably don't realize is Matt wasn't actually on the boat. He was on the boat for a month and for all the bite and all the crocodile stuff, he was on land because we talk about COVID um, and now we've got the timeline right. Um, we had to get an exemption to get into Western Australia. Oh. So we, we were always risking getting down here and not being allowed into that state or being cut off at any state for that matter. Cause it was literally like, it was like COVID was following us. Like we wanted to do um, workshops. So my charity was gotcha for life, which is a mental fitness charity. And we wanted to do workshops and speak to communities along the way. We pretty much had to stay at sea um, all on the East coast because COVID was hitting Newcastle and Sydney. And if we got COVID and that held us up, Guinness World Records say you've got to keep moving. Um, you can only stop in one place for two weeks. So like worst case scenario, we had to do, if we had to do a quarantine for longer than that. So logistically it was ridiculous. And the cost of the boat and, you know, people say, oh, you had a support boat. I was a hundred K up to see most days. So I literally did not come to land really that often throughout the whole thing. And even coming back to land when it finished, it was getting used to, cars and people moving and like crossing roads and when i'd come into land i'd be really clumsy and dropping things because out at sea everything moves slowly there's like no stimulation it's like the occasional bird and you see albatross out there it's not small birds mm. 
there's nothing. Time so becomes a big illusion, huh? Exactly. It's crazy. And we didn't have reception for a couple of weeks at a time. So say across the bite, that was 18 days in, in total, no reception. So it's like a whole other experience. It's a forced disconnect and it can be really healthy to do that. But Matt was on land, always had to think ahead, always had to, you know, think, um, you know, get those exemptions a couple of weeks prior, just got them in time, had to, when I got to land, we still had three days left that we were supposed to be at sea and I had to come into hospital when I finished um, the bite, get on the IV fluids and um, he had to organise all of that. So he was really the saviour in, in that regard. Wow. Let's talk about day one then. I want to kind of run through this trip. What date did you take off? Where did you take off from? Yeah. And yeah, what was that first week of paddling like? And what was like an average day? How long were you paddling? Yeah. Were you paddling for a block and then stopping and eating and then a block? Like, yeah, yeah give us a day yeah, in the life. Absolutely. And I think it's <laughs> the craziest thing is like, I had this perfect plan of nutrition and you know, I yeah, knew I was going to be burning like 10,000 calories a day. And I'm like, oh, we've got all this. We had all of the supplements. Our body science came on board for us. Um, you know, we were pretty, we were very organized in that space. And then day one came. So the 19th of December, 2021, um, I actually got blessed with a northerly on that day. So the biggest fear I had, I knew everyone was going to be coming down the beach at Mermaid. I was going to be hit with like a head on southerly and just be grinding at like 2k an hour. I was like, I don't know what you think she's doing. We got this like 15 knot northerly that picked up to 20 knots as we got to Byron Bay and I was able to surf all day down. So we got 73k done in the first day. And how um, long was that paddling? So that would have been around, we moved, I'm, I say we, I say we, like yeah. I've got someone with me. Um, yeah, it's your team. All right, you. yeah, that's why I always say team. Um, I move about 10K an hour in the flat. I move 11 to 12K with a bit of runs. And at the max, really, I mean, on runners, get up to around 18K, but to hold a consistent pace in really good down, I mean, 12 to 13K an hour. So that first day, it was more like, cruising um 11 12k it would have taken eight eight nine hours with jet ski come and give me a bit of food so that was day one um the next day from byron bay uh onwards i think it was 80 and by one week in i was up to 100k a day and people always ask me how you train for something like that you can't really train for 100k a day you can't get out there and do 100k paddles you're gonna go in and be injured because you're going to get to the line with you know some sort of soft tissue injury or overuse and certainly when I finished the paddle um, I had a bulging disc which I think was there for probably the last two months to be honest it's like managing load but also being in the best physical condition going in so I did a lot of gym work um, a lot of core and strength to make sure that I had that sort of base but I also um, put on 15 kilos leading in so um, that was a deliberate thing I knew I had to do. I knew I was going to lose weight. And sure enough, this is by fluke, by the way. Um, I didn't particularly do any maths in this, um, but I estimated it might look around about 15. And I lost pretty much spot on 15 the whole way around. So it was the heaviest I'd ever been. I did a couple of races for Mermaid Surf Club leading in, which I'm jumping on like, you know, well above, you, you know, athlete kind of weight and um, which is different for everyone. And I was just like, oh my gosh. So for the first month until I, I would have lost about six kilos in that first month, I actually felt quite uncomfortable in my ski. And it wasn't until really two months in where I started losing towards that like eight kilos and that, that I started feeling again like an athlete and the body just slowly conditioned. So I shouldn't downplay the 73, 80 kilos, uh, 80 kilometers because that was me laying on the back deck like wincing at the end of each day why Matt's trying to get the massage gun in and I'm like telling him to stop because I'm in so much pain like your whole body locks up every muscle you can feel muscles you never knew you had oh wow and at that stage that's when there's no all the media's gone all the crowd's gone you're down in you. the isolation of um you know somewhere in northern New South Wales and onwards and then by the time you get down towards Victoria, it's isolated coastline. You're a long way out to sea. And that's where it comes back to the reasons you're really doing it. And if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, you're going to find out because you're going to, in those times, go to the darkest places and you're going to, you're going to know why you're doing it. Why were you doing it? Well, it changed when I 
started it was for the selfish reason of a world record and that's what drove me through the preparation that's what drove me through probably the first week but I knew I wanted to do good with it and it was the gotcha for life um, charity and it was people reaching out to me so their aim is for zero suicides and it was people reaching out from the start to tell me about people they'd lost close to them struggles they'd had themselves and I was like that is all I need to put the first stroke in the water and I was sort of if I could get through what I was doing, you know, we, we build almost like a community um, of people online following. If I could do what I was doing, then maybe I could inspire someone to keep going in their hard time. That's what became the message that I guess we talk about, yeah, intrinsic motivators yeah. and, what, you know, that self-talk. It changed. I would have thought about that record after the first month really a handful of times. you got yeah. to do it for a lot more than a record when you're putting your life on the line you cruise life on the line and you're that far out to sea. Yeah, it's, it's so crazy. And it, it almost, do you think you wanted that world record maybe because you felt like you might have under, not underachieved, but not reach those heights of the Iron Woman career, maybe like your sister did and be like, this is where I want to draw my mark. But how many days did you end up out there? Yeah, 254 days, right? So, so it's it, it it's spot on. Like, And I think it's, it's such a crazy one because in Ironman, Ironman races, like you look at something like um, you AFL and, um, you know, how many you have on a list, basically. In the series, you've got 20 guys and girls in the series. You've got one. That's the champion at the end of each each season. Like, it's absolutely crazy. You've got one, right? Not mm. even like a team or or whatever. So um, it is that, like, even from the 1% that make this, you're like 0.00. And we are so hard on ourselves. And it's only a reflection now. I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually did some really cool things as, as an Ironman. I'm really proud of that. And, you know, I had race wins at Australian titles and things like that, but you're just so tunnel visioned on that one person that can win that series title. And yeah, absolutely. Maybe that was like, this is my thing. But then soon enough, you're, you know, the, the cruise spotting sharks next to you down the East coast. Um, you know, you nearly get hyper, you get near hypothermic, near Victoria, um, you know, scary, scary things that happen. And if you're doing it for that reason of um, external kind of validation from others, it's going to come out. It makes you ask a lot of really hard questions. Yeah, I'm like just in awe of what you have done with this crazy goal and this um, achievement. So now I want to get into like a bit more of the day to day so people can understand what you were going through because it's, it's almost impossible to conceptualize what you actually achieved. But what was the average day looking like for you? What time are you waking up? You said you're burning 10,000 calories. What are you eating? How many meals a day are you having to stop for? It's bloody hard to eat 10,000 calories yeah. in a day. It's so so yeah, what was it? What time were you waking up? What was like an average day looking like? Yeah. It honestly, the first probably month as we made our way down the East Coast, it was pretty standard, might jump in. It all depended on the wind though. Yeah. So we chase the tailwind. So basically if it's going to be windy, so we're looking at that northerly pushing us down, um, you know, if the wind's not kicking up till later, you might get on the water at 10 o'clock. So, you know, you're sort of um, having your brekkie later, getting in lots of calories prior. It might look like, um, you know, poached eggs on toast with some avocado like those good fats in there into your um smoothie um in the end we were putting things like um butter and cream into the smoothie um you know we were putting um you know all all sorts of things in there um as well as your carbohydrates too so I guess you're kind of looking at a pretty standard breakfast and then what you can do on top of that. And obviously the one of the most easiest ways is through fats. Um, you know, you can actually afford to eat saturated fats too when you're doing that much exercise. But after one, so pretty standard meals a day. When I was on the ski though, eating in the ski is a whole other story. So I'm paddling all day in the ski. If it's a good wind, you don't want to stop. It's like, um, you know, you're basically paddling a toothpick to get into the boat and the skipper has to mark exactly where you stop. It's a whole process. You've got to get the ski on. The skipper has to float around and then come back to the spot. So if you want an hour off, that boat could drift like 10, 20 kilometers in that time um, and have to come back to the spot. So I tried in the end to stay in the ski. So there were days where I was in the ski for 12, 14 hours without getting out. Um, 
I would eat in the ski. So they would come and um, basically hold a bucket out and I would grab from the bucket like my lunch pack, which would be things like wraps with chicken and salad. You know, you're trying to get lots of vitamins and minerals in there. Um, you know, there would, if I needed a quick little hit of sugar, um, there might be a couple of lollies in there if I felt my blood sugar starting to go. Um, lots of chopped up fruit, um, you know, things like crackers, things that were really easy to digest. Mm. So sometimes if you're in a ski all day and you don't have the opportunity to go to the toilet, you don't want things that are super high in fiber. So like mm. your vita wheats and things might be out. But once we got to Victoria, I got started getting seasick and that's when it all changed. So what went from like, six to eight kind of smaller meals a day that I could hold down thinking about what do I need more of carbohydrates getting my um we had voost um supplements as well with body science so voost like um do ones with calcium iron um all of the electrolytes in them giving my body exactly what it wanted once I started getting seasick I brought everything up so when I started getting seasick I would have this beautiful um you know, breakfast of a smoothie, you know, in a nice anchored calm waters of a smoothie where we put all that extra stuff in, put some avocado in there for some extra fats. As I said, your butter, your cream, um, you know, your coconut cream, take off, head back out to the spot. I'd stop the day prior, maybe 10 K out to sea. And for people who've been on boats, it's like being on a roller coaster. When it's choppy, you are up and down. And if you get seasick, everything comes up and not even just brekkie it's like dinner the night before mm, stomach lining everything it's for... exactly to the point where you've got literally acid reflux so the most distressing thing was being able to plan all of these things and for the first month have this plan and make sure you were meeting even your basic food groups and then after one month all of that going out the window but still having to paddle that same amount so that's what happened in the bite. The reason I lost that weight and I lost eight kilos in two weeks of body fat, basically, and a bit of muscle was because not only did I have nothing in my stomach, I was still burning that extreme amount of calories. So by the time I got to the other side, I was so dehydrated. I could actually barely walk by the time I came into hospital and, um, you know, had not eaten a proper meal in two weeks. So... It, it had to at some times go to just what could you keep down? You'd firstly try to keep down a wrap, bring it up. Then you'd go to chop apple, bring it up. And then you'd finally go to something like your hydrolyte or like a body science, like shake. And then once you brought that up, you just had to get in your ski and keep going. Far out. It just sounds like torture that you put yourself through and so many challenges that people wouldn't even expect when they hear Oh, she paddled around Australia. That's epic. Yeah. But it's like all these challenges that you faced would have just been unbelievable. So you've come around the bite. you got to go up the um, west coast of Australia. Yeah. What's the west coast like? Obviously, that time of year, the northerly, when you took off the northerlies to start the year off are pretty common. Yeah. Weather patterns in WA are a little bit different to over here. How was that leg, the long straight yeah. of over in WA? And are you like coming into land a bit more often once you're over on the WA coast? Yep. So our boat, um, our cat had to go back to Queensland and we had to find another boat over there. So it was sort of um, this time of, I guess it was nice. We had the jet ski and we were able to come to land more often, uh -huh. but there's a lot of Western Australia that's really remote. And I'm glad you said the word long because that state feels like it goes on forever. Like it is the longest, the biggest state when you look at it. And it is so diverse from bottom to top. Like bottom, I'm wearing thermals, like a jacket. I've got a beanie on. I'm rounding that um, southwest corner and then I'm coming up. And by the time you get to around Perth, it's flat. It was flat. So we sort of got pushed up with the northerlies, like you said. I'm um, sorry, with the, um, what are we looking southerlies. at there? Yes, yeah, yeah. southerlies, beg your pardon. It's so funny that too, because as I went around, I would have to change my way of thinking. I was like, oh my gosh, your tailwinds now are coming from, you know, the easterly mm. or then your southerly, right? That. Um, so getting pushed up with the southerly and then it went flat around Perth. But then you come into the areas, the big sharks. And I mean, when you're paddling around those areas of like Margaret River region, um, you may be 50, 100K out to sea and then coming in a little bit further. So you can't see land? No, 100K out to 
I reckon 40K from probably from probably about 50k onwards you really can't see land and i'm talking like right around like 360 yeah. so if, if that support boat isn't there i'm looking around with no navigation and can't see where you're going the only thing that could give you an idea would be the way the runners are going and that's only if you know the what wind way, direction right the wind direction and so the sun. exactly and and the sun to some degree and you've got to stay on top of that because that changes as well so by the time you get over to western australia you've got these incredible sunsets over the ocean and that's just something that's in spectacular mm. but then the way the oceans um the sun setting is changing on what what angle it's and on as well paddled, right yeah, yeah. so the whole thing, it's its really, really trippy. And you had to, I constantly kept thinking of the map and imagining myself and where I was in the map as I was making my way around. And I would, every couple of days when I had reception, check on my phone and see our little dot where it was moving. But then if I did that too much, I'm like, we're literally going nowhere and I've got this whole thing to do. But um, once the boat left, we had to stay in close because we had jet ski. And the furthest we went out with the jet ski was probably 20K. So we were probably doing more kilometers, a little bit more weaving. But it was a nice experience with um, with the boys. We got a lot of amazing footage. Coral Bay, Ningaloo is incre- an incredible part of the country. It's clear water, turtles, and there's whale sharks. We didn't run into one. But um, when we got to the top, that's when it kind of got serious again. Um, we were fortunate enough. We only ran into one great white near Perth. I should think, um, just casually say that. It was one of the last days we had our cat. And I was paddling. I was probably 200 metres behind the boat. And we always had someone on Bonnie watch. There was always someone on the boat who was watching me. And at this stage it was Jamie and he was watching me. And he saw the fin. He said he thinks it was a great white come up right next to me. And I'm just paddling along, got waterproof headphones in. And then did this deep dive under my ski and disappeared. And as we know, one of their ways of attacking. And so he's watching and he's telling me to come into the boat. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, like I'm coming. Like I'm getting there. Like I'm thinking he's calling me in for a feed or something. And this whole time he's like, I'm like, oh, his body language actually looks really serious. I'll paddle in. It was when I got on the boat, they told me. So I was tunnel vision this whole time. So stuff was going on around me. And there was another one in the Kimberley where they saw a crocodile out to the side. And I just had no idea. So it's like something off Jaws with like the water skier and the fins like in the background. But when we got to the Kimberley, we linked up um, with another boat, the Cruising Kiwis, a family who were traveling the world. And they took us through and some of the scariest waters you could ever think to paddle in remote like we made the joke that if you murdered someone out there no one would ever know there's just nothing around so for hundreds of kilometers you see no soul other souls no boats and we were on a little cat and we had to get some fresh fruit and water from these big cruise ships we ran into because you start running low and i'm paddling out there in 40 degrees and um you know i would occasionally fall off too so when i got really tired i'd fall fall out you're falling into the waters where potentially there's crocodiles in and you're trying not to splash too much as you get back into your ski and things like that. It's like, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting place. You've got to take your mind to, to get into that water every day, knowing what's in there. Yeah. Wow. I'm just like trying to wrap my head around like the head noise that you must've been going through. Were you listening to music or listening to podcasts or books? Yeah. What were you doing to fill your head? Because if you're doing eight hours a day, you listen to a whole new book every single day. Exactly. I'm a knowledgeable person on the planet after battling for 250 days. I made the joke of like, I'm going to learn French or something along the way, but I tried, I tried to listen to that stuff at the start, but it was almost too slow or to require too much kind of, I had to focus yeah. more. So honestly, it was, I got into Stormzy, Eminem, like cracked on that, like heavy rap, like all day. And sometimes I would take the headphones out. And I'd still have that, like, oh, whatever it's called, like reverberating basically in my eardrum. And there was even a time I was listening to so much music. I remember listening to a bit of Vance Joy. I would sometimes bring it down a bit more cruisy. And I didn't have my headphones in. I was like, is someone playing music on the boat? And they were like, no i was like no, no i can actually hear him singing i'm like it's vance joy like this quiet there's nothing on the boat so like 14 hours of things like banging in your ears you start hearing things but i had to do that i had to really almost like i said everything i've ever done is channeled into that like 
every foot I'd ever stepped on the line as an iron woman, uh, every line I'd ever stepped foot on is a better way of putting it, isn't it? Every line I'd ever stepped foot on, every training session I'd done, everything I had done in my professional career and in my life led to that moment of getting in the ski and really taking on essentially taking on crocodiles because you knew they were in there and there were certain times they'd be told do not go near this island like the skipper's getting told avoid that place avoid that place but we had to bypass the place because it was in our direct line keep the speed up keep moving and the other thing with crocodiles is they follow patterns so the reason they tell people don't go down and fill your water bottle up you know in these holes that's more for the freshwater ones but they'll watch and so if they see someone do something twice it's on the third go that they'll get you so the thing was to keep moving quickly and never stop in one place for longer than a day if we had to anchor and apparently when you drop anchor they come up and have a look at the boat so for that whole bit all you wanted to do was jump out and go for a nice swim you don't go in the water and I was having to get in there and and when I did fall out I remember I would always have to stay calm because if I was splashing and thrashing trying to get back in my ski that's the kind of thing that draws them so I'd just try and chill and get back on and then you'd get going again. But And that was a month along the whole top of the northern part of Australia, huh? along Northern Territory, yeah. top of Queensland. Yeah. And so that was a month of every day, the anxiety you must have carried. Was yeah. there any days that you just woke up and you're like, conditions are all good, but I'm just not in a headspace to paddle today? So many times by the end, like really, and, and that's what I mean, you like you've got to have the best reason for doing it. Like you don't even feel like you're in a race or anything with the person who's done it prior. Like I was saying, if anyone ever does this again, I'm going to help them every step of the way. It's, it comes down to survival. And um, there was a lady who attempted it, who got to the Northern Territory and had to bail out because these big crocodiles were following her. So it, yeah, it becomes more about doing it for a really good reason. And, um, I tell you, by the time we got to Townsville, I didn't actually realise how much it had affected me with the crocodiles until we got to Townsville and I all of a sudden felt like we are safe again. And, you know, essentially you can see them kind of down to Mackay, but that's when I knew it was those waters. So essentially a third of the coastline you can run into a crocodile. And then we started seeing humpback whales, which was incredible and felt like a reward for what we'd been through as well. Yeah, wow. So you're around that top part of Australia and you're on, I guess you call it the home straight, even though from the northern tip of Australia down to Mermaid Beach is a very long way. I always, the, it's interesting, isn't it like from Cairns to Brisbane is the same as Brisbane to Melbourne? Yes. Even though you think, you look at a map, you're like, oh, Cairns to Brisbane, both Queensland. But yes. Yeah, it's um, such a long way. So what's going through your head once you get around that northern tip and you yep. kind of starting to beeline it for home yeah. and what you've probably still got a month and a half left to get back home. Absolutely. It was a relief because just prior to that, to get to that tip, we had to cross the Gulf of Carpentaria. So initially taking it back those couple of years when I was planning, I looked at the map of Australia and you see two bits where you know are going to be the biggest problems, the Great Australian Bight and the Gulf of Carpentaria. And the Gulf, if you went down and underneath again, it's about a thousand more K than cutting across. So it was our next open ocean stretch. And I knew the seasickness I'd been through. And I was like, people are like, you know, you'll get your sea legs. It's not good. It was just as bad. I don't want to say worse. They're on par because across the Gulf, we got the southeasterly trade winds. So I was in the open ocean paddling, vomiting again, but we actually got headwinds. Um, the time of year we came through, really, in, in hindsight, it was, it, was, it was horrible, but you're going to get headwinds either way. You go around. So getting them towards the end, at least I was conditioned and in a better state. 14 hours a day. Um, it was the first time I did um, 200 kilometres. I did um, 213 kilometres. Um, so in the Gulf, I did 173. And by the time I got to the tip, I did um, 213 at the very top of the country. In a day. In a day. So I stayed in my ski all day and did that. And basically the reason why I did it, other than getting a record for the 24 hours, um, basically it was safety. So the skipper would come and tell me, if we don't get to this next island, which is 210k away, we're stuck there for a week. 
because the wind patterns change in certain sections of coast. So we say, we don't get there. There's 30 knot winds coming. We've got nowhere to anchor and we're stuck. So it all of a sudden became more desperate even than the tailwinds. So you're pushing all day for 24 hours, knowing that if you don't get there, you're in big trouble. So there's no choice. So once I thought the hardest part had been done, when we rounded that top of the country, we got sully. So the last two months of the paddle were headwinds. So this is the whole way around. There were different challenges. And even when we got past the crocodile, it was headwinds. I was like, it just made me earn every single kilometer that I did. There was just no hiding. There was just nowhere to go. You had to face it head on. And I said something like in a post I did a long ago about how you can't come back from something like this the same because it takes you to places. It forces you to face everything out there. Yeah. What were you saying in your head on those days that you wanted to give up? What was the driving factor to keep you moving? You've come too far to back out now. Everything, if you deserve it, you owe it to yourself to finish. You owe it to others and you owe it to your crew to finish. And there was a time very early in the paddle, um, about a month in, uh, sorry, about a couple of weeks in where I wanted to quit. It was around Port Macquarie. And it was when we started doing the 100K day. So I'd come up to 100, but my back was still not holding up well. And I wanted to pull out. I remember promising myself, I said, just get to a month. And if you get to a month, you're down in Victoria. It's, again, extrinsic factors. Like, it's less embarrassing. You won't be as much of a failure. And I told myself, get to a month and then see. And when I got to that month, I didn't want to let my past month self down. So I get to one more month. And then it became every thousand kilometers. But by the time I got to far north queens i was like there is no way i am backing down from this and in what would normally take me asked before how long it would take certain things so um i might have done 120k in 12 hours i went to doing 60k in 12 hours Oof. so a harder 60 to the point where i wouldn't i wouldn't have been able to pick that cup of water up um my hands were pretty much locked like that so holding the paddle all day they were swollen like twice the size and it's really only been in the last month I've gotten the feeling back after the joints and everything were, were horrific. So couldn't open doors, couldn't drink out of cups. Um, my crew had to do everything for me. Yeah, that's kind of the last little question before we get to the finish line. I want to chat about what sort of injuries did you carry throughout the mm. thing and what sort of recovery did you have on the boat, on the land? Yeah. Because as we know as athletes, as much as the hard work's important, the recovery is important. And when you don't have time to heal and time to recover it's really difficult so what were you doing to recover each afternoon and yeah how'd you get going each day was it like the first 10ks each day really hard i remember t listening to a bunch of ned brockman stuff and he sounded like that first 20ks each day for him was just so hard to get the body warmed up was that pretty similar for what you were going through oh 100 percent. like i felt like i was saying like a 90 year old woman like when i started so i learnt pretty early on that I was never actually going to feel good. The only time I'd feel good would be the first day after a lay day. And the lay day would be a forced lay day again for like 30 knot winds or something. That was the only day you'd feel good. So of the whole 254 days, there were a couple of days I felt good. Maybe the day paddling out from Mermaid. Um, so as an athlete and on that professional level, and you'll know this, you do everything you can to, you know, feel good and, um, you know, work on those little things like your flexibility and, and work on things like, um, you know, getting the massage and all of that kind of thing, your food. Um, but I learned early on that I actually wasn't going to feel good. And it was such an interesting mindset to get into because the furthest I'd raced or paddled for this was 50K in the Molokai racing that you feel tapered and primed to do it. This was like getting in the water after your body was shot. So even when I did that 213, like I had to get back in, you know what I mean? So it's like, you just can't recover in that time. And I felt my back getting worse and worse to the point where like something's actually wrong. And when I got back and the fears was like, you have a bulging disc, you need to stop. Um, you know, I was like, thankfully I'm done. <laughs> but it was just like agony, like for anyone to push, I was like, nah, there's, there's something not right. And the other one definitely was the fingers. And I was like, I, I feel as though I've got arthritis. Like I feel as though this is what it feels like. And I remember Matt asking me the question, um, in Cairns, so it was not far from home. And he said, 
if you had permanent injuries from this, would it still have been worth it? And I said, yes, without hesitation, because again, it was yes, if that, if I can help someone or a certain population or a group of people, um, help them through, you know, whatever their equivalent of their paddle around Australia is, and it would all have been worth it. So there was a lot of sacrifice, but I didn't even see it as I just saw it as a necessity to get it done. And I wanted to quit early on, but never really did I ever think I was actually going to back out of it because from the moment I picked up that book and the moment I head out from here, I I knew I was going to do whatever I could to get it done. I was going to have to be dragged away, you know, and I did get carted off to hospital, but it was going to take a really serious something to happen to, to stop me. And that was my biggest fear. I was like, I will be out here doing this. Please let something not happen. Like, yeah tearing something and you got it just real quickly when did you go to hospital was that after the great australian bite when you needed the um bite and i could barely walk in i remember feeling so weak as i walked in got a couple liters of the iv fluids all the electrolytes and everything pumped in i walked out and felt a lot better but an interesting one of that covid was so rife in wa and they were so strict on it I came out, had to get in the hos- um, to the ambulance and had police escorts to the hospital, which I don't know where they thought I was going, but that's how strict it was and the crew couldn't get off the boat. So, yeah, logistically, it was Matt was facing all these challenges and when we were crossing the bite, all he could see was yellow dot from the tracker on the boat for two weeks in his own quarantine watching that, no communication, wow. so... It's crazy. I'm just. I still can't really comprehend what you achieved. It's uh, it's unbelievable. So let's just talk about now finishing. Yes. Did you do like Brisbane to Gold Coast in one day? Is that kind of the last distance? It's about the distance we were paddling. Thankfully, um, so I got given the 28th of August as the day. Right, coming back um to the Gold Coast. That was the day they were setting up for the finish. Um, we were gonna have um seven sunrise was there. So it's like 28th of August. Got to get back. And these headwinds, I'm like grinding. I'm like, okay, all I want is one day off before the finish so I can greet everyone and at least like, you know, be half human, not like come off the back of like a 100K day. So I ended up getting that day, but I had to work hard for it. So we did Brisbane into um, a strati, um and basically um, anchored up there. And um, it was an incredible day. I had a couple of, I uh, had my sister join me, had a couple of um, the people from the surf club come and paddle with me for a bit. Um, we went to dinner with the crew um, because we were trying to kind of keep it low key that we were around. So yeah, basically hanging there. And then on that last day, I paddled out um, through the spit and back oh, down. Wow, just, yeah. Um, yeah, just there. So I did like 11K on the last day or whatever it was. And um, it was really, really cool. But the funny part is we were actually, I was trying to get there in time for the interview in the end and it was a bit of a rush, but probably the most beautiful moment was the last couple of K into, into Mermaid Beach. And I had some of the nippers from the surf club come out and join me, like the next generation and um, and these little girls and these little boys. And um, yeah, that was really, really special. And, um, you know, it's even now like every time I love these chats because I kind of bring up something new from the past and in the process of writing at the moment, it's also almost that process of healing. And I know for what a lot of us went through across the bite, as I said, I couldn't even talk about it for a couple of weeks and it was incredibly scary, but it was again a necessity. It had to be done. And if anyone ever does it again, I'll have all sorts of advice for them, the things that I, I learned along the way. But it's an incredible personal journey too. Yeah, wow. You should be so proud. So you ended up coming at 254 days, 250? 254 days. So and that was a world months. record, yes, yeah? yeah? So yeah. congratulations Thank on the you. world record. Thank That's you. just phenomenal. And like you said, for doing it all the right reasons. After the paddle, you'd raised over $100,000 for Gotcha for Life, which is just incredible to be able to donate to such an important cause obviously mental health is something very important to me what the crew Gus Walland Mm -hmm. and the whole team at Gotcha for Life are doing such incredible things in the mental health industry how important or how special was that for you to know that Mm -hmm. not only did you achieve a world record but you raised over a hundred thousand dollars for a mental health charity and I'm sure you dealt with all the mental health Mm -hmm. challenges under the sun with 
<laughs> literally under the sun over those 254 days. So yeah, what did it mean to you to be able to raise so much money? It was, yeah, and it was really an ironic thing because, um, you know, prior to that, it was sort of my experience with, you know, we talk about that loss of identity and everything. And I could see how someone could sort of spiral into that, um, you know, and then it was through COVID seeing the effect of the isolation on people. But ironically, it was through this journey that there was isolation, you know, there was uncertainty, there was all of those things that people feel and struggle. And I feel like, you know, the paddle can almost be used as that bit of an analogy and so many messages within it, things I learn about myself means I can, you know, speak freely to people about that. Um, and it's amazing what, what Gus has done. I mean, he started Gotcha for Life when he lo- lost a close friend to suicide and you really feel and see his passion and how he speaks. And um, that just increases my passion even further. And I think we all need to prioritize it because it's not ourselves, it's someone close to us. You know, it's um, one in five at any given time struggling. So, you know, statistics are there that were climbing through COVID and, um, you know, there is some incredible people like yourself doing some amazing work in that area. And I'm just, um, yeah, really grateful if I can yeah, make a small drop in the ocean in that area and um, it would all have been worth worth the struggle. Yeah, wow, good on you. It's just so phenomenal. Last little thing I want to talk about, what was it like coming back and dry land and being in bed knowing you don't have to wake up the next day? Is, what was it like to assimilate back into yeah. society and not be out on the water and use your legs again? Yeah tricky like I lost my wallet somewhere along the way so I had no idea where my ID was like my card I'm like oh my god I'm gonna be a normal person again how do I do this and the one thing I fantasized about the whole time was sitting at Cafe on Hedges and having poached eggs on toast which is a cafe across from us and when I finally did that I said I just want to read the paper and sit there and I did that and it felt so so it probably feel still felt like I was on the boat but it felt so surreal but it really did take that month or two to get used to it and um yeah it was it was amazing to be able to share the journey and it's really interesting instead of the record people talking they were talking about gotcha for life and it sort of put it on the radar of so many people who had never spoken about you know mental fitness so I would say anyway everyone who donates is going on and investing because they're reading about what gotcha for life is so that made me super excited but it took a little while to get used to when I first turned the television back on for the first time I was like wow I don't even know what's happening I missed like a year of music and shows and um and news you would have missed so much news about of COVID and stuff like cycle for like a month at a time we came back and they were like guys like there's a war going on between Russia and Ukraine actually started a month ago because we've been out of range for a month and Shane Warne died and all this stuff. And it was one month prior. It was crazy. Wow, it's just so wild. Well, like I said, congratulations. Thank it's you. incredible to achieve a world record, incredible to do something that not many have ever done on this planet. It's just like so special. I feel a privilege just to be able to sit here. It just seems so weird that at one stage in your timeline, your reality was out to sea hundreds of kilometers out and right now we're just sitting in our safe little couch I here know, I'm I glad don't. no crocodiles well that I know apparently did I see one at Stratty or something recently I heard about right that. yeah I heard oh, they're following crocodile. me yeah that's not cool. yeah you brought them around from the NT <laughs> hopefully not but far out this has been such an eye-opening chat I'm so grateful to share this room with you to hear your story from someone in mental health um I just want to say thank you for the money that you raised for such an incredible charity like Gotcha for Life what I want to touch on real quickly before we finish is what's the plans now after achieving something so big, it would be so hard to come back and find your identity again, because there's obviously so much more to you than the world record and the paddle around Australia. So what does the future look like for you now? Yeah. And that's exactly right. And, um, I've sort of sketched out the um, chapters of my book and the last one is don't come back to nothing. And that's what I kind of told like myself the whole time. Cause I'd been there and I'd done that and I'd raced and had a bad result and had nothing to come back to. And I knew after this, and I'd had warnings from people who did expeditions have something lined up and it lined up uh, at mermaid where i got offered the job of head coach of the nippers and i was hesitant at the start i thought oh i'm gonna one of these do these projects post paddle but i said yes and it's one of the best things i've ever done the kids keep you on your toes they're coming up to their state title soon but it also allows me to do is invest in um the book and the documentary that that we're going to make so um you know through social media um we sort of shared a bit of the journey but 
there is so much footage we haven't shown um all of those things i touched on and the writing process too so hopefully end of the year for those projects so i'm really exciting putting everything into them and um a lot of research into you know the best ways to go about it you know publishing a book and all sorts mm. of things so that's a new challenge and um it'll be yeah really special to share the journey well i cannot wait hopefully netflix or one of the big um companies pick up the documentary so it can be seen far and wide because like we touched on probably like the scratching of not even a tiny bit of paint off the surface today i'm sure there's so many stories in there the ups and downs the triumphs the hard days the easy days and everything in between that are just going to blow everyone's mind i can't wait to read the book and can't wait to watch the documentary too because I'm sure there's some beautiful footage in there from all around the country which is the country that we're very lucky to call home but now I'm sure you have a very different perspective of how bloody big the thing is. Absolutely and there are so many beautiful parts too you're right there are some incredible I would encourage anyone to get out there see the country it makes you so grateful and beautiful uh, it's you know the nature natural wonders of the world I said we didn't run into a whale shark but maybe hopefully in the future. Yeah far out that's yeah, I just am finding it so hard to comprehend what you've done. And there is a lot more things that I do want to talk about, like your dietitian work and stuff. But I reckon we're going to call it here today because your story about this world record is just something so phenomenal. I guess the last thing I'll give you is just a bit of time to maybe thank anyone who really helped you on that journey, whether it be the sponsors that came on board, um, your team. Yeah, a little opportunity to thank them because I'm sure the listeners will... Yeah. I'm sure you'll want to thank and let the listeners know that there was more to the team like you kept saying we did this so yeah who do you want to thank who came on board to really support the journey absolutely there were times where the boys said um you know say i don't oh, know it's naturally in me to say we so my husband matt who yeah after those couple of weeks came on board i would never have been able to do it without him he organized everything from exemptions to where we were going to get fuel from in the middle of nowhere um blake jamie and ben were the three my core crew that came the whole way around and never once to their credit did they ever talk about backing down or quitting they gave their time and everything they had into it and they were put into some really scary situations so certainly to them as well um and shoreham partners financial services came on board at the start where they had no reason to believe in the project they've done a lot to equal the opportunity for men and women within sport as well and believed in this believed in me and believed in me as a female um and the last one would be gotcha for life and the incredible team there gus and his team and um you know the emotional and mental support that they gave me throughout and they talk about having a, a village of people around you and you know through those incredibly people uh, you know incredible people and my own immediate family um, i did really have a village that got me through yeah wow it's just like so cool to know the journey that you've been on the people who shared that journey and the people who supported that journey and that it all was around for mental health is just so special. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much for inspiring so many, hopefully a lot of young women as well. Like you said, not only were you the fastest around the country, you were the fastest to do it as a woman too, which is just so incredible to inspire younger generations to go out there and chase those big, what seem unachievable goals. The last question I do finish every Good Humans podcast with is the same for every guest. And I'm going to ask you, what does being a good human mean to Bonnie Hancock? It means thinking about others as well as yourself. It means um, investing in things that make you a better person, finding your passion and chasing it, and then using that to help others. So I'm very grateful in the opportunities that I've had. I've had others lift me up to get me where I am, and now I help. I hope to help pull others up as well. So I think instead of pulling people putting people down you pull others up and finding your passion because i think that makes you a better person and when you're a better person have that positive outlook on the world that spreads it's that energy that spreads so yeah i was i was lucky to find my passion early but everyone can find passions at all different times of their life so um find your passion you're gonna have that flow and effect very beautifully put well thank you so much for coming on i guess last thing where can anyone find you if they want to find you on socials website yeah. i will leave it all in the show notes but yeah last little chance to let people know where they can find you yeah totally so yeah all a lot of the videos and photos um are on um instagram so at bonnie hancock is the handle us uh, the paddle of oz on facebook and uh we've got youtube as well under bonnie hancock so there's um yeah some of the things i've talked about there's videos on there um that the boys edited and a lot more coming out at the end of the year wow well i can't wait 
yeah, we'll leave it all in the show notes. If you've enjoyed today's episode and you've been inspired by it, please do me a big favor to tag both myself and Bonnie on an Instagram story share. I'm sure she would love to answer any questions if she's if you've got any about that crazy paddle or if you want to go on it yourself, as she said, she's happy to help people try and achieve those unachievable goals. So big thanks for jumping on Good Humans Podcast. Such a pleasure. Thank you.